Pronoun da. Croiso. And welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Today's uh, session is on how to grow. Desi delighted to see all your faces popping up on my screen. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, today's meeting is part of a week long global solidarity, Global Indod 2021, which is a summit hosted by Hub Cymru Africa, funded by Welsh Government's Wales Africa programme. And all of today's sessions are around the theme of sustainability. There's still time to sign up for other sessions across the week if you're interested in gender and inclusion or amplifying partner voices. So you just need to go to www.hubcumryafrica.org and click on Summit 2021, see the full schedule and sign up. Recordings are happening for each of our sessions. So that will be available after this, after the summit. Um, but if you do not want to be recorded, um, then I'd ask you to please turn off your camera. Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, also, if you've missed a session because we're recording them, they're going to be available at a later date. So just keep an eye out for our newsletters that come from communications at hubcomeafter.org. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce myself. I'm Hannah Shepherd. I am one of the development support managers within the Hub Come Africa team. I'm here just to, as sort of a background host, really, um, just to make sure the session runs smoothly um, and safely in this virtual meeting room. Um, before I introduce our speakers today, I just want to run through some really simple um, housekeeping rules. So as this is a Zoom meeting, please uh, make sure you're muted unless you're actively speaking. Please rename yourself and your organisation in your Zoom window if you're happy to be recorded. We're going to um, put some polls up and ask you all to complete a feedback survey. It's really helpful if you're able to participate in those because it enables us to, it informs the work that we do and it helps us know if we're getting things right. So it's really valuable. So I'd ask you to participate in those. We also encourage people to actively participate, but nobody's required to. So if you have questions, we're going to have breaks within the presentation where there'll be Q and A's. Um, but we'll also, you can also chat to other participants within the chat room, um, or you can put questions up for the speakers, or when we come to the Q&A, you can raise your hand um, and wait for the speakers to come to you to unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, and then we also have a few ground rules. So we just, this is a safe space for minoritized people. We ask you to treat others with respect. So no form of abuse will be tolerated. We do encourage challenging and constructive conversation, but people's lived experiences are not up for debate. I hope that you won't have any serious concerns or about safeguarding after this session, but if you do, then you need to go to www.wcia.org.uk and look for their whistleblowing policy, and that will give you the details of what you need to do. Okay, so... Um, we do have a Slack channel with which you can contribute to, uh, to conversations with other participants. Um, I'm going to ask my colleague Peter to put that um, link into the chat box for everybody. Um, and you can also contribute to the Twitter chat about this using hashtag Global Indod 2021. I'd also like to highlight that I am using auto online PowerPoint captions today. So they're not 100% accurate, um, but they are very useful for people who have additional needs. So uh, I'm going to keep those on. So I'm gonna just launch a very quick poll, um, which is the aim of which is to inform our work over the forthcoming year about supporting networking and learning within groups. So I'd ask you to have a read through of those potential learning groups, learning peer learning groups, and let us know if you're interested in any of those and how you might be interested in participating. Um, I will give you a few minutes to have a look at that.
Great, I can see some coming in now, very interesting. And for those who aren't interested, don't forget at the bottom of the list, there's, um, and the first question, there's a not interested button you can click. But it looks like there's quite a lot of interest, so that's fantastic. Okay. I'm going to give people just uh, another five, 10 seconds, and then I'm gonna close the poll. Lovely, thank you folks. Right then, I'm not gonna share those results because they're quite internal for us, so please excuse me. And now we can get on with the session, how to grow fundraising and beyond with Bees for Development. So we've got with us on the call, Janet Loare, who is the project manager for Bees for Development. And also she's joined by her colleague, Richard Harrington, who's also gonna to speak to us. He's head of communications and fundraising. Good afternoon and over to you. Thank you very much, Hannah. And thank you for inviting us uh, to deliver this session this afternoon. Richard, do you just want to say hello? I'll just unmute myself and say hi, everybody. Yes, hello. Great. Great. So I'll just proceed with the presentation then. So how to grow fundraising and beyond. That's what uh, we're going to be talking about today. I think Hannah's going to move me on to the next slide. So I just want to introduce Bees for Development. Uh, we're uh, based in Monmouth in South Wales. This is the front of our shop. Uh, however, our shop is also our office and our headquarters. So our office is our access to, through our shop and that's where we sit in normal times, not at the moment, of course. And the shop unfortunately is not open at the moment either. Uh, we uh, were established in 1993, so we've been going for a number of years. We've grown over that period of time um, from being a purely voluntary organization to one that uh, now uh, where we have a team of 10 people, some of whom part-time, some of whom are full-time, but of course, still very much relying on our volunteers to help us in many, many different ways. Next slide, please. Uh, above all else, Bees for Development is driven by our uh, understanding of the role of beekeeping in uh, changing people's lives, both in terms of the role of bees for pollinating, food crops, um, the income generating potential, and success accessibility for uh, people of all walks of life, including the poorest people. And that, of course, drives our work above all else. Next slide, please. We're helped in so many ways by our, uh, by our supporters, our patrons, and uh, recently joined by our president, HRH, Duchess of Cornwall, um, seen here talking to one of our colleagues in Ghana, uh, which is a really very exciting for us to be given this support. Um, so we, we're also very much assisted by our patrons um, who help us in different ways, depending on their own uh, uh, skills, their interests and their capacities. And it's, and it's marvelous to be able to rely on them in so many different ways. So our goals are uh, to alleviate poverty through beekeeping and to increase biodiversity with bees. And those two go hand in hand. Uh, we recognize that um, using bees creates, is an income source, but that uh, bees also support biodiversity through their pollination uh, services. But beekeepers um, work very hard to protect habitats for bees. So in doing so, help to support ecosystem services as well. And both those goals are really key and underpin Bees for Development's work. And how we achieve our goals, uh, is there's two main ways. Uh, we are, run an information service, 
um, to people in developing countries who want to learn about beekeeping. And we deliver community-based projects, which are discrete projects, uh, time-bound in particular communities, solving particular problems or developing particular opportunities. Next slide, please. And today we're going to be talking about uh, how our organization uh, has grown and with a particular focus on fundraising. But of course, as you, as I hope I'll be able to explain, fundraising is, is not a separate thing to the work that we do. It's part and parcel and is you know, fully integrated with our, in the work that we do and the impact that we have. And we're going, to, I've sort of broken this down into three sessions. One talking about, well, there's quite a lot to talk about really in that fundraising. <laughs> and so uh, we felt it would, we to really sort of give a sort of snapshot and a sort of introduction. We thought we'd look at three topics. One is sort of the, a fundraising strategy in the broadest terms. And then I'm going to drill down into talking more about individual giving. And then I'm going to hand over to Richard who's going to talk about appeals and campaigns. And we're going to um, have Q&A in between each session. So I hope that's going to work. So in uh, building a fundraising strategy, one of the things we, and I should also just say that, you know, this is what we're gonna be talking about today is what we do and what works for us and about our experiences. And we're um, by no means, you know, we don't know everything and a lot of it is work in progress for us as well. And so, um, you know, any other organization, you know, pick and choose and, you know, take from it what you can, but, um, you know, there may be things that don't work for other people that have worked for us. And um, so I hope, I hope it'll be insightful in some respects. Uh, so the first thing really is to say is that fundraising is about uh, building a broad base of different sources of income and a number of income streams. Um, so I'm going to take you through some of those which have worked well for us. So individual giving is really, really important. And so this is people making donations. Um, small donations of five pounds or maybe larger donations, but individual giving. And this depends on, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail in the next session, but this is important because I suppose it's sort of, it's where we, perhaps where we started and it's, um, you know, it's the foundation or the, or the bedrock of the organization it's relying on our individual supporters. And this depends on reaching people. We have to, we have, in order to attract a supporter, we have to reach them in the first place. So that we have to, so people have to know that we exist and what we do. Uh, so reaching people and then telling them, you know, say, telling them something that makes it interesting for them to find out more. And that process of reaching people and attracting people is quite a process in itself because of course you people may hear about these for development but it may be um you know it may not be the maybe the first time they hear isn't the first time that they donate so they may be that they're just sort of trying to find out um so that in itself is quite is, requires quite a lot of work in terms of reaching people and uh, explaining and giving people the information they need. Having, you know, once we have supporters, we have to take care of people and understand what they want and what they want to hear and what they want to be told in terms of feedback. Is it more, is it less? Uh, some people maybe they just want to give and they don't need updates or newsletters. Other people um, maybe want to hear more. So it's important to understand that. Um, and there's also practical elements like, you know, the donation platform that you use has to be user friendly. And it, it's, it's nothing more frustrating than somebody saying, oh, we, I tried to give you a donation, but the, but the 
internet didn't work or the platform didn't work or I don't like using that platform or um you know there are there it has to be an easy process so there are practical issues as well as the sort of relationship side of things as well but I'll talk more about individual giving in a minute we also apply to grant giving organizations so for example UK Aid Direct to give an example um, the Wales and Africa program to give an example um, and a few of the things that we've learned over the years that might seem obvious but it takes a while sometimes <laughs> to realize what uh, where, where, when you go wrong read the criteria and the guidance uh, of course and in detail and follow it uh, match your project what you're trying to do to the um to the criteria of the donor and it's okay to um you know, the, the inevitably, sometimes there's, you you might be moulding your project to fit their criteria, um, but it, you have to recognise if it's not a good fit and try not to waste your time trying to fit uh, your project if the criteria are just if the donor is just looking for a different type of project. Um, sometimes processes uh, these application processes have a two stage process, a concept note and then a full application. And if you're lucky, you get some feedback on a concept note. Always take note of that feedback and respond to it. Uh, we've, sometimes we get feedback and we think, oh, that's a, you know, we didn't agree with the feedback or, it, or we didn't understand the feedback, but it's, you, you have to take note of it and respond to it. Um, that's very important. So applications, grant giving organizations is, is part of our fundraising. That's an important part for us. We also um, we also do fundraising events, and there are fundraising events, and there are events. And so, when I why do I what do I mean by fundraising and events and events? Some some events are about um, meeting new people and uh, getting known. Um, and taking part, whereas some events are very much more uh, the stronger objective towards fundraising. But it's actually not, always, you're not always, there's a bit of an overlap between the two, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so there, they very often are about building relationships as well as raising money. The larger events, uh, if they're your own event, will need an event organizer. And we have been in recent years uh, delivered a bee garden party uh, in uh, Marlborough House in London, and that's quite um, a logistical exercise. And we have been fortunate to uh, find one of our trustees has helped us organise that. Um, but there's a huge amount of work involved. So if you do don't go down that route, be aware um, and plan accordingly. And, works if you've got somebody who can you can rely on but everybody has to pull their weight and it's and it's a and it's a big undertaking so don't underestimate the work involved but then of course that depends on the scale of the of the event but fundraising events is also another part of our fundraising we also have participated in fundraising cam campaigns and appeals such as big give and radio 4 and uh, Rich is going to talk more about appeals and campaigns uh, a little later on. Uh, a few things we've learned is that match funding is really attractive for supporters. So if you can tell somebody that, um, you know, if you donate £10, it'll be doubled to £20 and we receive £20. That's really a very, um, that's very appealing. Um, fundraising campaigns unlike sort of applying to a grant giving organization which tends to be more reliant on evidence and data of need a fundraising campaign relies more heavily on um, case studies stories testimonials 
images, and that's very important to attract support. That's a, that's a lot can hinge on having those good that good content. Some appeals, depending on the type of the appeal and the platform, you may find yourself appealing to your existing supporters. If you can then use the appeal to reach new supporters, that's fantastic as well. So to give an example, Radio 4 is a really good uh, opportunity to reach new um, audiences, new supporters. Um, uh, the big give, um, yes, but that's very much down to us um, to, to take that campaign to our existing supporters. Next, please. We also uh, raise money through retail and commercial activities, so selling things. And our shop in Monmouth is a case in point, so that's a gift shop and beekeeping supply, selling beekeeping supplies. We also run beekeeping courses. I mean, our approach to this is that, you know, if it's connected to something that we know about, we know about bees and be related things. So this seems a natural fit for us. We've never sort of really sort of gone into retail or commercial that's not related to our core interest areas. Um, we're trying to make a profit. We're trying to make money. We're trying to raise money. <laughs> so you have to think about the costs versus the profit margins. But, you know, we're always thinking that maybe there's, you know, we hope and we our aim is that these opportunities also provide a chance to meet new people and maybe provide another engagement opportunity uh, beyond uh, some of the other mechanisms that I've mentioned today. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is, a, is another part of our fundraising. And please do come and visit our shop, which is, as I said, is shut at the moment. Uh, we do have a web shop, an online shop, and but of course we hope it'll be open again soon. So just to summarize, a diverse portfolio is good and I haven't mentioned everything. Um, people fundraising for you. So for example, some we have some wonderful, wonderful supporters who um, do their own fundraising on our behalf. Um, so sponsored runs or bike rides, cake sales, making donations from the sale of their honey. That's marvelous. That's really fantastic support as well. Um, and uh, working with corporates is also another. Uh, so anyway, I haven't mentioned everything, but a diverse portfolio is really good. Everything needs planning. Everything has its own set of skills. So organizing an event or completing a funding application are very different skill sets but they're all uh, they all require quite a lot of know know-how and um, there are costs associated with each uh, mainly in terms of time communications does come into everything that's a that's a cross cutting across all our different uh, fundraising mechanisms and do think you know, about what your team like doing and what they're good at. Um, there are, as I've mentioned, a number of different options. So sort of a, there's, then you may find that your team have a natural inclination towards one um, approach compared to another. And that's always, a, that's always helps. So I think that is the end of the first quick session. So, I, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. I and mean, I'm sure Richard will help me answer questions if, if I can't answer. Thank you, Janet. That was really interesting. Um, I'm gonna keep an eye on the chat box. Uh, I'd invite anyone to put their questions in there or put their hands up. But um, I just, I wanted to talk to you about your images. You said that images are really important for a campaign or any sort of fundraising. Can you talk to me more about how you choose your images? For instance, I see they're really, they seem to be very dignified in how they approach people you work with. 
just from an outside perspective? Uh, thank you. Yes, we, um, images, gosh, that's a whole topic in itself. Um, <laughs> there's, yes, we're trying to show the positive. Uh, we're trying to show the good news stories. Um, and we're trying to present and also present, you know, things as they are, the way it is, people's real lives, their real experiences and situations. Um, an image needs to tell a lot in one image. And I think that's where the challenge is. So you want to be able to show something about the person and something about the activity and something about how it's changed their lives. And capturing all that in one image is sometimes quite difficult. <laughs> and can, I add, can I add to that as well? We've, we've yes, learned to get a bit selective. We've learned to get a bit selective about images. and. Um, so it, essentially we choose not to use some and really it's all about quality um, so and I'll, I'll explain a little bit later but it's really helpful to have a real story to go with the image too um, so it just makes it all that little bit more compelling. I can see that I've jumped ahead into your your presentation later on so um, maybe I should turn my attention to the chat box and relate some of the questions from the people um, who don't get as much contact with you as I do um, just a question here is 80% um, of U US funding, I'm not sure what that means, 80% of funding of NGOs is said to come from individuals rather than foundations, trusts and businesses. What would you say is the figure for the UK from your research? Right, okay, so what they're asking here is the balance. What's your experience in terms of the balance. So. Okay, I think they, I think they, when they say US, I think they're talking about United States. Yes, I realised that from the late further end of the question. <laughs> um, I don't know what the figure is for the UK as a whole. Um, from our uh, oh gosh, Richard, um, I would say it's now about maybe about a quarter. I'd say so. Yes, there's a later question as well about investments too. <laughs> really, we're we're split into probably three or four major um, inputs, and I'd say of of the two company companies and trusts, and I'm I'm talking in an unrestricted sense here. Um, so companies and trusts, I would say, probably equal individual giving in in our model. Okay, great, thank you. But no, it doesn't include investments. No. But uh, OK, so it's not investments, but um, Richard was referring to when he's talking uh, about companies, he's saying companies. Yes, corporate donations. Corporate donations, right. OK, so that's quite an important stream for you then. So we've got a question here about how did you find your patrons? And another here about what advice you would give to a small organisation on where to prioritise fundraising efforts especially to those without an employed fundraising specialist, which I think reflects most of the people working in the global solidarity sector in Wales, mostly we're a volunteer sector. How do we find our patrons? Um, uh, different for different patrons. I, uh, it's through, through uh, meeting people, and finding that we have a shared interest or, or they have a shared, have expressed an interest in our topic or in us, and then asking them if they're willing to be a patron um, to perhaps more of a uh, sort of thinking that they would add value to our organization and approaching them. But there has to be a reason, there has to be a connection mm. um, about what a shared, a shared set of values. Um, so that really comes first. So we, we might identify, oh, that's interesting. It looks like that this person, you know, is on our wavelength and understands what we do. Maybe they would like to be a patron, maybe they would be able to help us. And then we ask them. Great, thank you. Um, what advice would you give to a small organisation where to prioritise fundraising efforts? As I said, I think it, it depends on kind of where your sort of your natural skill set or your natural inclination. 
Um, but in all cases, you have you have to um, obviously weigh up, um, you know, the costs and the time involved, whatever it is, whether you're whether you're whether you've got an employed person doing it or it's a voluntary. It's it, it, it's still about in, in sort of investing the effort for the for reward. Um, but I think I would say that we we started very much with uh, appealing to supporters. That's where we started. Other things have come later, like the corporates. That's a much more recent thing. Uh, I hope that's correct. Um, so maybe the, our next session about talking about individual giving will will be helpful in that regard. Shall we move on to the next session then, in the interest of time? And we can always come back to this last question. At okay. At yeah. End. Is that okay, everybody? Yes, that's absolutely Gordon, fine. We hope to come back to your question. Okay. Okay. Here we go. All right. The chat box. I also feel right. the next question could be relevant to this session. So. <laughs> So more about individual giving. All right, so let's see what the... Yes, please, next slide, please, Hannah. So individual giving is about... There's a whole lot of things going on all at once here in terms of reaching people, reaching new audiences, uh, nurturing our supporters, uh, making them feel important, making and giving them what they want from being a supporter which is different for different people and also we we started thinking i would say conceptually rather than perhaps practically about this term donor pathways so that's about you know meeting somebody for the first time uh talking to them about our work or they visit our website telling them more and you know that may there may be some steps before it, you know they make a donation and then we hope very much they'll make a subsequent donation uh, so that's what we talk about the pathway it's a journey but as i said it's a, it's a bit of a conceptual thing that we're still working on and developing uh, a few years ago we were helped by a volunteer who um uh who shared some of his experiences about uh, fundraising with us. And he introduced this term, the leaky bucket. And uh, basically it's, it's trying to explain that, yes, the next slide, yes, please. It's trying to explain that, you know, as a, with individual giving, the important thing is to focus on the people rather than the money. And because we, uh, we can attract, we can do a campaign and attract uh, donations, but actually it's the people that have donated that are, that are valuable for us. So to get a donation, one donation, money comes in, but if we don't get another donation from the same person, then we just, then that, that we've lost, we've, it's almost like we've lost that support. And we then have to go out and look for another person to give us another donation. And that's hard work and expensive to look for another supporter. When somebody has already expressed their interest in our work by making a donation. So it's beholden on us to, to maintain, I'm not sure this is very polite really, but maintain the, <laughs> <laughs> the supporter in the bucket, as it were. <laughs> so we don't want to be leaking supporters. That all sounds very clinical, doesn't it? But the point, the, I think the next slide is perhaps maybe focuses, uh, helps us a bit better to explain that we want to focus very much on, um, on the people and the donors. Uh, they're, they're the value. They're, 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 they're the ones who are helping us. There are um, you know, retaining the existing donors that have expressed an interest of make a donation is really, really important for us. And then that makes us ask questions about why people donate, what do they want to hear about subsequently? 
Um, do they want a newsletter? Do they want to be told how their money is helping and who's it helping? How often do they want to hear from us? We don't want to bombard people. Um, so then there's investing in that donor relations is really, really important. And we also hope that with time, a donor may feel um, interested to take out a regular donation, for example. So, and I want to talk a little bit more about the donor, what, what we're thinking about a donor pathway. Um, so this starts with attracting people to us in the first place. So that could be through social media um, and other networks, events, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's important to make, to our, yes, we're asking for a donation, but it's important to say what we're asking for uh, and how people can respond. We can't be too shy about it. Um, if people want, you know, we are asking people to support, so we need to say why and say exactly what, what we're looking for. Thanking people, of course, uh, I hope this goes without saying, um, but that's important. That's and, and can be quite a, you know, logistically, that's an involving thing. You know, who's given us a donation, when, and how do we want to thank them? Is it by email or letter? We need to be telling people how their money is used. Um, if they agree to hear from us again, we may then ask for people to give again, maybe for something specific. Uh, if we're doing a campaign or appeal, we need to keep communicating uh, within the rules about um, keeping people's data, of course, and using their data. Uh, you know, having a culture within the organization that recognizes that supporters are our most important asset and need to be regarded as such. And then we, we like to invite people to take out a direct debit or become a regular giver. Uh, that's important. I mean, it's, it's, it's important in terms of income raising, um, but it's also cost effective and it helps us to know, to be able to gauge and plan and forecast how much money we might get in the next year. Whereas with one-off gifts, it's difficult to predict. Then of course, you know, behind what I just talked about, the, those many different bullet points uh, that make up a donor pathway is the administrator, administration and data management behind that, which um, cannot be, should not be underestimated. So saying thank you is important. And um, as I said, is that by email, is it by letter, uh, when, um, sometimes, you know, it, sometimes if we get a donation from, for example, a beekeeping association, they may want a letter because they want to put it on their notice board, for example, so they can share that to all the members. But it could be the opposite. They may want to prefer an email so they can forward it to all their members. So a simple thing like knowing actually helps. Uh, we have to be very aware of data protection issues and um, asking people for their consent uh, about whether they want to receive our newsletter. So that's very important. We can't just automatically assume people want to receive our newsletter. Use a database, we have a database of our supporters um, and we are endeavoring to tailor our communications. This is um, how long has somebody known us? We don't need, if someone has been a supporter for a long time, we don't need to keep telling them who we are and what we do. Whereas someone's only just joined us, maybe we do need to tell who we are and what we do. Um, and it's not, you know, if someone's been a supporter for years, it, they don't want to receive an email that treats them as if they don't know us. They're, they're our friends. <laughs> this is a relationship that we have. 
So we need to try and build on that rather than keep going back as if they're strangers to us. Yeah, so that's a bit about individual giving. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Janet. Um, now, does anybody have any questions about individual giving? Um, Gordon's put his question in in the last Q&A, which I do think is relevant to this, which is how successfully have you overcome the fundraising challenges posed by COVID-19? Um, we have not been able to hold our events or attend events. So that's been a big um That's been a big thing, of course, with COVID. Um, oh, these, these words are interesting. Uh, yeah, sometimes they? they're inaccurate. Probably best not to look. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll just overlook that one. <laughs> um, so you're saying you haven't been able to attend events, yes. um, which yeah. promotes so, you to right. new audiences. So then we've had to think more about online and mm. doing stuff online. And I think a lot, like a lot of things with COVID, you know, we're being pushed on online, mm -hmm. and that's being, you know, proving quite an eye opener in lots of respects. Mm -hmm. um, it can be you can reach more people being online than if you go to a physical event. So we have to try and turn that to an advantage. Um, and it, it, I don't know whether it's more, it, it could be more cost effective. I don't think we know for sure. Um, uh, but these, I suppose that's really what we've been experimenting with. So we, um, for, to give an example, at our bee garden party, in previous years, we've had uh, auctions that have been done physically. And last year we did an auction that was 100% online. Well, that in some respects was, uh, was easier than having, than having to do it uh, physically. So, so there are some positives. Thanks, Janet. Um, and one more question before I guess we should move on because it's already quarter past three. Uh, we've only got 10 minutes left of the session, really. Do you have any examples of incentives for encouraging regular giving and direct debits? And I would just like to know what system you use. As you talked about the, 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 the platform that you used. Yes. Got any tips on that? Can yeah. I answer that one, Janet? Yes, please do, Richard. So I, I think um, uh, incentivizing, you can really use a good... Um, Again, this will sound terrible, but um, uh, things that people just can't say no to. Um, so, uh, for example, we have a lovely book by uh, an expert uh, in bees uh, called Professor Tom Seeley, um, which offered to people who might just be considering donating or might not. Um, really, you know, we um, we found that for beekeepers specific. So, really, I think the answer is be audience specific about what you're offering as your incentive. Okay, so what you're saying is you had a bit of bee themed prize draw or? No, oh, um, a book that if you signed up with us, uh, the book had been donated and we could pass it on. Um, the If you sign up by direct debit, you receive this and it's yours. Oh, lovely. Um, so, uh, and that was offered at a national honey show where almost everybody who came along happened to be a bee beekeeper. Oh. Um, so it worked well. And so it feels like out and out bribery. Um, but actually, you can really tell that people are actually, you know, they want to give to you anyway. And this is just something like the icing on the cake. Mm. Mm. OK, thank you. So do you have a, a, a management system that you use for keeping track of donations or enabling people to donate quickly? I may come on to that when oh, I chat okay. next, actually. All right, then not I'll in great detail, but the answer is yes. Uh, but yes, I will mention right. that. I'll make sure shall I do. We, shall we move on then? There's no more questions in the chat box so over to you Richard. Brilliant uh, right so I'm going to assume that most people here come from organizations a bit like ours a bit like Beast of Development uh, where effectively you know that you're doing wonderful work either here in Wales or within the UK um, or elsewhere and if only you had the money you could do it all so much better 
Um, and so I would say that yes, appeals or campaigns, as you might like to call them, um, are one good way of doing that to provide a focus for you to be able to, to make money um, in a way that really um, can, can achieve results. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so they're very exciting. Uh, we run various different kinds of appeal and we're looking for doing other ones in the future too. You don't have to stick to the, the big well-known names and the ones with match funding even. You can simply do things like uh, um, you know, events with local sports societies. So I'll show a photo in a moment of one we did with uh, uh, several hundred Father Christmases and uh, a, bee in a, a, a guy in a bee suit sort of thing. Um, but so appeals specifically can be very exciting. Um, as Janet said earlier, uh, that incentive to say a person or an entity is willing to double whatever you give um, can really make a difference between somebody giving or not, and also in how much they give. So you'd be surprised at how generous people can be, but at the same time there is an element of jeopardy. And if you can imagine, sometimes you get offered a certain sum to match what you're expected to raise, and imagine if you didn't reach that uh, total you would, you would feel like you'd lose that amount of money being donated to you by that other, other person or entity. Um, so there is always that bit of a worry. But if you can move on to the next slide. Um, in, for example, the Big Give is an appeal that we run and we have done for several years now. I think we've done every single one since 2011, bar one. Um, and we found it a learning experience, but also a good experience for fundraising. And actually many of our supporters in that supporter journey are very familiar with it and so it's a good um, hook to use for people who will actually say to us you know I want to give you some money shall I save it till a few months later to give it to you and I know my my donation can be doubled. Um, so I suppose on the negative side there's, there's always things to learn um, and you really do have to do the work so you have to make sure we are not a big organization I don't know if uh, you might get the impression about Beast Development as being a, a large organization, but yes, we're large in scope. Our, our reach is to many places around the world, um, but there's around 10 of us full-time or full-time equivalents working with several really key volunteers who actually do a lot of the, the work for us. Um, and everybody has to get involved in the appeal. So it can't just be a one person thing um, and you have to use everybody at your disposal and also every channel you have at your disposal. Uh, so next, next slide, please. So what have we learned? Uh, one of the things is to keep things really simple. It's very possible to try and present to the world everything you do as an organization um, and to try and cover uh, in a very comprehensive way to help make people understand the work you're doing. And actually what you really must do is to pare things down to simple messaging. So you want to get your messaging straight at the very beginning. Um, you can use your patrons um, and they can be really helpful even just a quote from somebody like Sting or Monty Don uh, is all they need to do that you can use on your materials. Um, and it can be a, a real clincher for people. And we have found that, that that makes a difference. But the one piece of advice that I really would give um, to people if you're considering doing any kind of appeal is to be ambitious. Now, um, when I first started a development two years ago, um, we'd been growing beautifully um, the, the levels of funds we were, were bringing in anyway. Um, and so in the first year, um, we would brought in a grand total of uh, £64,000 in an appeal. Um, we were then able to raise that in the next year simply by saying, let's just let's not worry about those terrible risks involved in not reaching your total. Uh, let's really go for it. And we managed to raise £80,000. And even last year, um, we were even more successful. Um, so I would really say uh, it pays to uh, not try, if, if you think you can achieve your target, raise it, raise it a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I say do pull out all the stops, don't be afraid to try new things, step out of your comfort zone. And another key point is, as, as um, Janet mentioned, really look after your donors. So don't see the person who's giving a one-off donation in that slightly old fashioned way as a person who's perhaps uh, popping a coin in a plate or um, uh, kind of a, a one off thing and it's just the money. Those people are that those are people who uh, are supportive of your cause as well and can be used for other things as well as donating. Uh, and they're really your constituency of, of support. Um, so I'd say really do focus on that. Uh, next slide, please. 
you do need to plan, uh, but don't be afraid to adapt. And this is just a tiny example. Um, during last year's appeal, we set up lots of materials and had lots of good ideas for uh, strap lines and um, ways that we would approach people. Um, and we set up with a give life this Christmas message to start with. And that was prepared in something like October or September last year. Um, but then as we were going through and I, we were just making some materials to use for corporates and other supporters to share on their digital channels, uh, we came up with some new materials, having also just got some lovely new footage and some lovely new images actually from the, this spot in Ethiopia where our campaign uh, was raising funds for. And so that came in a week before the actual event started, the appeal. Um, and we kind of coined the strap line, make life better with bees, um, with apologies to Janet, because I know you've used it before, a good year or so before that for something else. Um, but so effectively we changed our messaging uh, at a very late stage. Uh, and not only that, but could you just show the next slide? Um, we really realized that the making life better with bees things was a really beautiful strap line for bees for development. And we've had various strap lines over periods, but uh, we've now really adopted it. And uh, it's a big part of our ethos. So if you look on our website, um, it, it's a strap line that we use alongside with our logo um, and something we plan to do more. So I would say, do make sure you plan well uh, and execute your plan, but don't be afraid to take opportunities when they're there. Next slide, please. Um, so in summary, uh, our appeal last year, we set a target of raising £100,000 and actually we really quite considerably smashed it. Um, and for an organisation of our size, raising £114,000 is a super amazing amount of money um, and would enable us to do, to do a lot. Uh, but very interestingly, within that, um, so I'll just... apologies, that's my son ringing. Uh, the, uh, we reached the target. Uh, we had a really lovely number of donors, 769 of them, of whom 359 had never donated to us before. And we know this because we use our data systems. Um, and uh, that's a, a really encouraging sign and, and, and really um, those, those people are now with us uh, on our journey for the future. Uh, if you could just tap next slide, I think you'll move on to just a couple more lines. Um, so just to summarize, in the end, everything you do as an organization, as a team, um, goes together. So when, you, when, when people are working as for example, Janet as project manager, she is, she is the, uh, the voice of the organization and she is communicating and fundraising just as much as anybody else is. Uh, I would also say if you're running an appeal, run it to your organization's strengths as uh, Janet said. And I would say for our organization, one of our strengths is really looking after our people. Um, we have a very personal approach um, and uh, we really build trust with our followers and with our supporters. Um, but what I would say is do not be afraid to make the ask um, and then at the same time as saying please don't forget to say thank you and make sure that you really pay strong attention to that um, and yes use a campaign as an, opportunity, as an opportunity to raise funds but also work out to try new things and, and work out where next your organization your organization can go um, in its uh, in its activities. And finally, uh, believe in yourself and your team because you really will need to. Uh, you will need to use up every, every element of your team uh, for the entire campaign appeal period. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Hannah, you're on mute. <laughs> the phrase of 2020. Thank you so much, um, Richard and Janet, for that. Um, really informative presentations, and as a few people are commenting on the chat, how informative that they are. Um, Richard, what would you tell me? What what do you use for managing your um, supporters' donations? Uh, do you mean in terms of softwares? Yeah, softwares. You know the digital. The digital tech but behind it that enables you to really look at well we've got 359 new people here and 
afternoon. Well, it's really funny. So, um, you know, so we just happened to use something called Salesforce. It's okay. just one, of, one yeah. of those databases. There are many others available. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I would say is, uh, so we've set it up really well. We have really, um, we are lucky to have really good staff and volunteers who have a real knowledge of systems and also an appreciation for the value of the contents of those data systems which are of course people they're lovely mm -hmm. people who um, you communicate with and this is just a vehicle for you to look after them better um, but then we also use other systems to communicate with them we don't send emails from uh, that database for example and and that sort of thing um, but so yes it's it's actually from time spent looking at the data okay great rather, rather than the software itself as someone who's donated as well, I must say, I do appreciate the email that you get from the chair or the trustee or somebody who just says thank you for that. You know, there's a very personal approach that you take. And it does mean that when I get your newsletters through, I go, oh, what's happening? You know, I'm, does I do feel that as somebody who has on an ad hoc donation given, on an ad hoc basis given a donation. So, you know, from the other side, I can see that how it works, you know, because it's worked with me. Brilliant. That's really good to hear. And other feedback would be critical feedback. If, for example, you, uh, it was felt that we were asking too often or too much mm -hmm. uh, or overstepping marks in, in some way, uh, often feedback that is critical is the most formative to help you get better at things. So that's another piece of advice I give is don't don't see criticism as just criticism. See, see it as an opportunity to um, to learn and learn from mistakes. That's a theme that's actually come up throughout the summit, you know, is failing forward, you know, actually learning from failure and taking that forward. So thank you. I've got a few questions coming up on the chat. Um, do you find it useful to ask for donations to a specific project or is it always for the organisation as a whole? It's from Natalie. My point of view is I really like using the more general approaches to show how uh, the, the work that you do in general and how people can support that. Um, but often uh, there are donors specifically who have real interests in perhaps a country uh, or a specific location within a country, um, or perhaps they have a background which is in education or something like that. Um, so uh, as ever, the answer is a bit of both. Okay. But Janet, also, you might have a view. Well, if it's if we're asking for donations from individuals, we, it may not be a specific project, but we do use specific examples, very strong specific examples, to say this is the project we did last year, and we are raising money to do more work like this, so that people have a very clear sense of how we use their donations. There's also um, charity commission guidance, isn't there, around, you know, if you say you're going to use that m money for that purpose, then you absolutely must use it for that purpose. So I imagine from an organisation perspective, there's benefits in both approaches. There are, yes, there is. There is. That's right. I think um, we are just hitting 3.30. I haven't seen any more questions come into the chat. So I'm just going to before I say thank you and we close I'm just going to share a quick poll so we can just get a bit of feedback um, from you all in how you found today's session um, let me launch that poll now that's just a few very quick questions for you um, if you could all have a quick vote of those that would be great I hope you keep the results private, Hannah. I'm, going, I'm not going to share these straight away, no. What we're going to do is we're going to amalgamate them out into the summit report at the end. Great. So, yes, it's not sort of a death by feedback for our speakers here today. Um. <laughs> Great, I'm starting to see the results coming in now. Thank you so much, everybody for your, your clicks, it's very much appreciated. Okay, I'm just gonna leave that for just five more seconds and I'm gonna take that down. I'm not very good at counting to five, as you can tell. 
<laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Okay, and um, because that's not really a, a way where you can share your um, perspectives more fully, I'm going to pop in the chat box um, a feedback form, which would be very grateful if you'd be willing to click on that link and give us any more substantive comments that you may have um, on today's session. Um, and that just leaves me to say a very, very big thank you to both Richard and Janet for sharing their experiences of Bees for Development. Um, I really hope that's been useful and insightful for you all, as it has for me. And um, please do carry on and get involved in conversation on the Global Eendod 2021 on either Twitter or our Slack channel. So I will say thank you and uh, ask your apologies for going two minutes over today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Lots Bye. of lovely wavy coming back. That's nice to see. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.